All right, well, thank you and welcome everybody to Wi-Fi 6. As a courtesy to you all, I am not going to try to reproduce the E noise because probably half of you will drop off immediately and I'll probably lose my voice and won't be able to finish the talk for the other half of you. Um, if it pleases you to do so, please imagine the noise now. All right, so today I'm going to be taking a bit of a high altitude survey of large changes coming to the Wi-Fi networking landscape. Um, another way of putting it is that I wanted some extra motivation to really dive into these upcoming changes, so here we are. I'm going to cover essentially three things today. I'm going to talk with, about a little bit of background outlining how we arrived where we have, uh, talk a little bit about the fundamental operations of Wi-Fi that lead us to some certain problems. Then I'm going to move into a broad discussion of the new IEEE 802.11 AX amendment to the 802.11 standard, which the Wi-Fi Alliance calls Wi-Fi 6. Then I'm going to go into recent developments related to the U.S. Federal Communication Commission's April vote to expand the unlicensed spectrum available to Wi-Fi and some of its consequences. In both cases, I'm really trying to take a high-level overview of the important pieces of 802.11ax and the 6 gigahertz band without getting too far into the weeds on technical details, because as with many other Wi-Fi related subjects, there's a lot of weeds and we only have so much time. I'm Chris Daw. I'm a Seattle-based consultant, certified wireless network administrator, co-founder with a shadowy cabal of Apple admins of Seattle in the Great Northwest. I co-develop a one-day workshop on Wi-Fi with Tom Bridge of Technolutionary in Washington, DC. And you can find me on Twitter and in the Mac admin Slack at CTDaw. So how did we get here? I think that the importance of the developments I'll be talking about today doesn't become clear without a basic understanding of what Wi-Fi 6 is attempting to change. So I'm going to begin by talking about just a few key characteristics of Wi-Fi that are relevant to the discussion. This is not a comprehensive overview, but a few key points. There are a few things as Wi-Fi administrators that we take as truths that we need to deal with. The first is that we have to remember that Wi-Fi operates on a principle in which a transmitting device using a particular Wi-Fi channel attempts to avoid transmitting at the same time as any other device on the channel because simultaneous transmissions generate collisions and loss of traffic. Collisions generate retry attempts, which generate additional traffic on the network and overall performance of the network suffers as a result. In order to avoid collisions, Wi-Fi devices essentially contend for the right to transmit on the network. As the number of client devices on a wireless network grows, so does the effort required to successfully obtain an opportunity to transmit and gain access to the medium. As the number of active clients associated with a basic service set or network climbs, both the individual device performance and the aggregate network performance falls because more devices sharing a finite amount of bandwidth and airtime means that any individual device will have fewer opportunities to transmit. In other words, the busier your network gets, the more your performance suffers. Remember, only one device on a channel can transmit at a time, otherwise collisions, retries, sadness. A second key thing to remember for today's discussion is that right now, Wi-Fi operates in two primary frequency bands, each with a limited number of available channels. The older 2.4 GHz band only gets three non-overlapping channels out of its 80 MHz of allocated spectrum, even though there are 11 channels designated for the 2.4 GHz band. That's an old but very long story. The 5 gigahertz band, on the other hand, gets approximately 500 megahertz of non-contiguous spectrum, ranging between 5.170 gigahertz and 5.835 gigahertz, giving us a total of 25 non-overlapping 20 megahertz channels and a correspondingly smaller number of 40 megahertz and 80 megahertz channels. Now, this 5 gigahertz band looks like it's got a lot of channels, but the overlap between the unlicensed 5 gigahertz spectrum and other incumbent technologies, mostly radar systems, has adverse consequences for us. 
in the five gigahertz band, avoiding interference with radar requires us to use a technology called dynamic frequency selection and requires us to avoid terminal Doppler weather radar, that is wind shear radars near airports subject to heavy thunderstorms. In certain geographic areas, some channels are entirely off limits, while in other cases we may find that access points will, without any warning at all, drop all of their client device connections and switch to a new channel. This can be challenging for certain services. I hope that VoIP call that you had in progress wasn't important because if an access point needs to switch channels, your prop call probably just got dropped. Consequently, if our network design needs if our network design needs force us to exclude DFS channels, you can see from this chart compared to the previous chart that five gigahertz is limited more than we think. As a third background point, let's look at some application bandwidth requirements. I assume that most of you are working from home right now, so I've documented bandwidth requirements for a few relevant tools. Zoom conferencing is documented on the Zoom site, requires two megabits per second for up and down um, bandwidth for a single screen conference. Google reports that their meet ideal bandwidth is 3.2 up and down. And then Netflix, depending on the type of streaming you're trying to do, five megabits, 25 megabits for ultra high definition, but let's be serious. Oh, I do that. So with these bandwidth requirements in mind, let's take a look at my own 16 inch MacBook Pro here at the house. Looking at Wi-Fi signal, I see that my system has negotiated a 216 megabit TX rate on a 20 megahertz channel. Because Wi-Fi is half duplex technology, I can expect to move something in the range of 100 to 120 megabits a second if the channel isn't very busy with other devices. What's really interesting about this to me is that even though I can send or receive that, that 100 to 120 megabits per second, using Zoom or Google Meet, I may still only be sending or receiving something in the range of two to four megabits per second. Now, remember that because only one device can transmit at a time, I'm forced to conclude that in many cases, even though I can send 100 megabits of data, I'm not. Even the narrowest possible Wi-Fi channel in the current standard represents an utter waste of spectrum resources. Smarter and more experienced people than me have performed extensive research re reinforcing this notion. At the 2016 Wireless LAN Professionals Conference, Chuck Lucas Zaweski from HPE Aruba summarized data from their research in which they found significant inefficiencies in the way that Wi-Fi uses the spectrum available to it. In the end, HPE Aruba's reporting suggested that the bulk of data frames on a busy office network were less than 256 bytes, whereas the maximum size is 1500 bytes or larger. It's a really fabulous talk. I have it in the notes and I definitely recommend you watching it. So these inefficiencies are hugely wasteful and costly in the same way that an empty flight home is wasteful and costly. If we're gonna continue accommodating growth in Wi-Fi networks and increasing number of devices on our network, something has to change. And boy, howdy are they gonna change, we hope. The first major chain has, change has been arriving for the last year or two in a preliminary way in the form of Wi-Fi 6, also known as 802.11ax. A brief digression here, 802.11ax and Wi-Fi 6 refer to what is functionally the same thing. IEEE designates the standard amendment as 802.11ax in its numbering scheme, whereas the Wi-Fi Alliance looked at those letters and decided, you know what, in order to simplify product marketing and descriptions, they were gonna move to a simpler number-based description, Wi-Fi 1, Wi-Fi 2 through Wi-Fi 6, with each number roughly corresponding to a generation of Wi-Fi technology. No more confusing letters. In any case, you'll hear me use these terms interchangeably. 802.11ax slash Wi-Fi 6 is also known as high efficiency Wi-Fi, and it brings with it a very different set of design goals than previous generations of Wi-Fi.
where his desire for raw speed has arguably driven the development of previous generations, IEEE's focus for 802.11ax lies in improving the efficiency of our networks. There's a whole lot in the AX feature set that I'm going to go through, or rather a whole lot available, but since I'm really focused on the efficiency of 802.11ax for today's purposes, I'm going to specifically focus on three main features. I'm going to talk about OFDMA, I'm going to talk about MUMIMO, and I'm going to talk about BSS coloring and spatial reuse in some detail. So let's start with orthogonal frequency division multiple access. This is probably the most important new feature of 802.11ax from a network efficiency standpoint. And it's the piece of Wi-Fi that is likely to turn everything you know about existing Wi-Fi on its ear. A little background on this. To understand OFDMA, Start by understanding that one thing we typically gloss over in our discussion of Wi-Fi channels is that a 20 megahertz channel, for example, is not a monolithic entity. Rather, channels are composed of a number of subcarriers, also known as tones, and those are slices of the overall spectrum that our Wi-Fi interfaces can transmit on. Prior to Wi-Fi 6, OFDM under 802.11ac and 802.11n used subcarriers spaced at 312 kilohertz apart, allowing a total of 64 subcarriers on a single 20 megahertz channel. This is the total count of subcarriers, and while most are able to be used to send data, not all are. 802.11ax, on the other hand, reduces the subcarrier spacing um, to 25% of the previous spacing, down to 78 kilohertz or so. So now that we ha now we have 256 subcarriers available within a single 20 megahertz channel. This greater number of subcarriers facilitates slicing and dicing the 20 megahertz channel, and 802.11ax slices channels into groups of 26 subcarriers or multiples of 26 subcarriers. We call these slices resource units, and 802.11ax can combine and recombine them in several different combinations. The rationale underlying these resource units is that 802.11ax can effectively subdivide a 20 megahertz channel so that it effectively transmits on smaller subchannels, sending data to multiple recipients simultaneously. With OFDMA implemented, we still have a requirement for a device to contend for the channel, and we still have the limitation that only one device in the BSS can transmit at any given time, but now that device can transmit to multiple destinations simultaneously. The slide here lists the various combinations of resource units available within a single 20 megahertz channel under 802.11ax. As you start to work with 40 and 80 megahertz channels, the number of possible combinations becomes both dizzying and kind of intimidating. AX differentiates the functions of OFDMA between what device is doing the sending, whether it's the access point or the client, and handles the management of those differently. Downlink OFDMA essentially describes the access point transmitting data to multiple client devices, and uplink OFDMA describes client devices transmitting to access points. And OFDM, whereas a visualization of the older OFDM transmission mechanism 802.11ac might be represented this way, in which each block of color represents one transmission from one device addressed to a single recipient device. By contrast, an OFDMA communication might be visualized like this. An access point sends out a single preamble across all frequencies in a given channel, then addresses targeted frames via resource units in several of these subchannels of the 20 megahertz channel. OFDMA can pad data if there isn't sufficiently large enough amount of information to match the length of other transmissions, but 
In this case, I'm using a simplistic set of rectangles to suggest a three subcarrier transmission consisting of two 106 tone and 126 tone transmissions destined for two laptops and a phone. So the idea here is essentially we take that airplane that was empty and we fill it up with stuff and we send it to multiple destinations. That's an analogy that like most is gonna break down on you if you think about it too much, but that's the fundamental idea. Second up, Wi-Fi 6 continues to implement the multi-user, multiple input, multiple output scheme first introduced in 802.11ac. Multi-user MIMO works a little bit differently from OFDMA the idea behind multi-user MIMO is that our access points may grow to have either four spatial streams available or eight spatial streams available, and that these represent different radio elements. With, with multi-user MIMO working, we can divide a transmission among different radio chains, and then we can use transmit beam forming in order to identify targets for separate transmissions and transmit two geographically separate targets, that is geographically separate clients. Wi-Fi 6 adds to what was done in 802.11ac by adding a concept of uplink mu MIMO or uplink mu MIMO in which client devices can also transmit to access points separately. 802.11ac was strictly download MUMIMO access point to client devices. So this will be interesting. One of the things that comes up in much of the documentation is discussions of whether it's going to be possible to combine MUMIMO and OFDMA transmissions so that not only are we sending to and receiving from multiple client devices at once, we're also targeting different sets of data to make sure that we're using our frames efficiently. Yeah, it's a lot to take in. So the third component I want to talk about from a standpoint of network efficiency is what's called BSS coloring, basic service set coloring and spatial reuse. This one is interesting because BSS coloring and spatial reuse are treated differently in the IEEE standard schedule for arrival as part of the technology. They're slated to arrive in different phases of 802.11ax rollout, um, but one depends on the other in order to work. Here's an example in which I've laid out sort of a theoretical map of a notional four channel network plan using 20 megahertz channels. And I've drawn cell borders at a signal strength of negative 67 dBm, representing my minimum coverage requirement. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take all of the access points on channel 36, and I'm gonna color them red just so they're easier to see. In a plan like this, everything looks nice and neat with well-separated zones of coverage. Unfortunately, coverage patterns this neat are essentially fiction. In a design diagram, circles like this typically represent the limit of a minimum level of coverage. The problem with this visualization is that it feeds an assumption that radio signals somehow hit a magic wall at your coverage edge, and then they just cease to exist. But that's not the way that it works. Signals keep traveling, and the inverse square law is such that the signal attenuates slowly, and signal remains detectable at a vastly further, greater distance than it can be effectively used. So for the next slide, I'll expand the circles to show the borders of my channel 36 cells with an edge at negative 85 dBm instead of negative 67. Negative 85 is the signal, is the level at which a signal may still be strong enough for a Wi-Fi client to have to deal with it and interpret it, but it's not really strong enough to be useful to a client. So we expand those cells and they look like this we see that there's a vast area of overlap among all of the access points running channel 36. In these areas of overlap, devices associated with one access point will still be able to hear and decode the traffic sent by devices of the neighboring cell, with the consequence 
that there are vast areas in this design where a client associated with one access point will treat traffic to and from a second access point as something that it needs to treat for medium contention. In turn, that creates co-channel interference and it slows the overall performance of both network cells. In this diagram, note in the dead center of the coverage envelopes for all four of those APs on channel 36, they all converge and overlap. A client located there would therefore be contending with the traffic from all four of those access points in order to gain the right to send. So keeping this scenario in mind, if we implement BSS coloring, that is basic service set coloring and spatial reuse, each access point on channel 36 ends up tagged with a different color and with a spatial reuse on effect, devices associated with the green access point will be able to distinguish that cell's traffic from the traffic in the red cell on channel 36, the yellow cell and the blue cell, and will be able to ignore it for the purposes of contention and co-channel interference. Spatial use is planned to function in part via detected signal levels, so ignoring it isn't necessarily going to be automatic. Cells will need to be far enough apart that the member of the red cell can reasonably look at traffic from the green cell and include, hey, this traffic is relatively low signal strength, but it's colored for the green cell, so let's just drop it. Reverting the coverage envelopes to the negative 85 cell edge then, although the cells continue to overlap on the frequency, clients will be able to distinguish among the cells and our issues of contention will decrease measurably. So, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we, are we there yet? What's the implementation of Wi-Fi 6 gonna be like? It is a pretty cool set of capabilities. When do we get to work with this in the field? Some of these techniques are expected to be easier and harder to implement in the chipsets. So as with 802.11ac, 802.11ax, Wi-Fi 6, is going to arrive in two waves, with some of the more technically challenging implementations held over to wave two of the technology. In particular, neither uplink MIMO nor spatial reuse are expected until the second wave of Wi-Fi 6. And really in the marketplace right now, wave one capabilities are just starting to arrive in the real world. Uh, as far as adoption of Wi-Fi 6 goes, it's still fairly early days. Vendors have been releasing access points with HE, that is high efficiency capabilities, but with the exception of new deployments and forklift upgrades, Wi-Fi 6 is still a bit rare on the ground. Using Wi-Fi Explorer, I was able to run a passive scan uh, near my home, really from my dining room table, and a passive scan in Wi-Fi Explorer picked up four Wi-Fi 6 networks out of a total of more than 100 that it found. Looking in the detail for the network, you can see that the BSS I have highlighted reports a BSS color, but if you start to look closely at the capabilities of the access point, as advertised by its beacon frames, dig into each one of those capabilities, you're going to see that in a lot of cases, the advanced features are not supported, such as this indication that OFDMA resource allocation of resource units isn't enabled. In this particular example, what I've picked up is probably a Comcast cable modem at a neighbor's house. Technicolor is a pretty common vendor for Comcast out here in the Pacific Northwest. So at the same time, you can see that some of our larger scale vendors, um, people pushing a lot of equipment down into the consumer marketplace are implementing Wi-Fi 6 as it ships. Looking at Wi-Fi 6 clients, we see that Apple has released a few Wi-Fi 6 clients. Uh, the core group is the, the iPhone 11 series and iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Pros. Uh, 
the iPad, iPad Pro fourth generation, which just shipped in March of this year, and the iPhone SE 2. Again, these have 802.11ax chipsets in them, and if you capture a probe or an association request, you can see high efficiency features having the groundwork laid. Uh, essentially, at this point, compatibility features. But what you find is that when you dig into the more advanced features, these things are not yet supported. My guess at this point is that these more advanced capabilities will show up in software at some point, but Apple hasn't announced any plans for this that I'm aware of. Note again here, most of these devices, all of these devices are iOS and iPad devices, and Apple hasn't introduced anything like this into the MacBook or MacBook Pro lines. So a final note on the backward compatibility requirements for A2.11ax. Unlike 802.11ac, 802.11ax slash Wi-Fi 6 is expected to run on both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency bands, and it's expected to coexist with previous generations of Wi-Fi. Coexistence like this with previous generations typically proves to be one of the greatest challenges for a new generation of Wi-Fi's primary benefits, in that it takes significant amounts of time for enough capable clients and a new generation of technology to arrive in the market to provide the benefits of the increased efficiency or the faster networks or so have you. Indeed, backwards compatibility both serves and hampers Wi-Fi, with the prevalence of older technology inhibiting the advantages of newer technology, but with older technology brought along in the service of customer continuity. At a certain point, though, wouldn't you love to just be able to move to an entirely new technology like 802.11x without this sharing with older technologies so that you can provably realize the benefits of the new technology in a more obvious way? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, do I bring news for you? Um, on April 23rd, 2020, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission began making this pipe dream a reality by voting to make 1,200 megahertz of additional radio frequency spectrum available for unlicensed use, which is the use category that includes Wi-Fi networking. The spectrum ranges in frequencies from 5.925 gigahertz to 7.125 gigahertz. And in general, we're colloquially referring to this as the six gigahertz band. Oh, just to note, yeah, Wi-Fi 6E. To get a sense of how much spectrum 1200 megahertz is, let's integrate the six gigahertz band into our chart comparing the two and four gigahertz band channel counts. Again, what we call the 2.4 gigahertz band is really just a tiny 80 megahertz of contiguous spectrum in the ISM band that provides us with three usable 20 megahertz channels. The 5 gigahertz band consists of three non-contiguous chunks totaling 500 megahertz, providing us with a total of 25 usable 20 megahertz channels, of which 16 are subject to the special DFS rules and therefore problematic in at least some implementations. The upshot is that as we've noted elsewhere, regulatory compliance is such that we only get uncompromised use of nine of those 20 megahertz channels. And in a lot of cases, vendors don't support nine of those. Uh, sometimes they fail to support channel 165, leaving us with eight. Six gigahertz, on the other hand, brings us 1.2 gigahertz of contiguous spectrum, which gives us enough spectrum space for 59 20 megahertz channels. To put it another way, more 80 megahertz channels are available in 6 gigahertz than 40 megahertz channels are available in 5 gigahertz. So that sure sounds like a lot, but can we visualize it? What's it look like? Wireless LAN Professionals provides charts showing the layout of the various spectrum allocations and their channelization. Here we have the relative sizes of the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz spectrums. So what we'll do is we'll take that and we will go ahead and try to fit the 6 gigahertz spectrum and it doesn't fit in a 16 by 9 slide. 
We only get into the mid six gigahertz before it slides off the edge of the screen. And for our purposes, we have to resize the whole image in order to get this thing to fit like this. This representation manages to render the slide format kind of useless while still giving you a sense of the scale of what the FCC has opened up. The good news is that Wireless LAN Professionals makes this file downloadable via electronic versions, and I have a link to it in the slides. So how many channels again? Focusing on six gigahertz, we see that we have a vast number of channels, enough that when combined with other features, it may finally be feasible to run 40 or even 80 megahertz channels in an extremely dense environment without incurring too much in the way of co-channel interference. When six gigahertz becomes a common reality, I might even get to stop shouting at people about only using 20 megahertz channels in dense environments. And this is all great, but if it weren't enough, six gigahertz has been designated for the exclusive use of 802.11ax slash Wi-Fi six. In other words, the expansion into six gigahertz gives us exactly the wide open environment that I was talking about hoping for one which is unburdened by the limitations of previous generations of Wi-Fi. So we see a number of benefits. We have a vast increase in spectrum and channel availability, which gives us the option to run at wider channels with less co-channel interference. And we're essentially creating a greenfield environment by dropping legacy Fi modes, that is previous generations of Wi-Fi. So what's the catch then, right? There's always a catch. Even if we're getting to move into a whole new band and leaving older technologies and their limitations behind, the shift is gonna have a number of consequences that are gonna make this kind of interesting. Our challenges are gonna include incumbent technologies, um, some natural consequences of having more channels, and they're going to include issues around adoption of the technology and dealing with legacy technologies on the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. I'm gonna talk a little bit about all three of these. Note that the FCC only took their vote approving this band expansion in April, 2020. So at least some of this is speculative and much of it is far from settled. So incumbents, who lives here already? Incumbent technologies are those that already use a frequency band when we move into it, and which may be subject to interference from the millions upon millions of Wi-Fi client devices that we can expect in the new band. Boy, do we have some interesting ones to deal with. In particular, the Uni 6 and Uni 8 subset of the six gigahertz bands have incumbents in television that use mobile transmitters. The most familiar of those are gonna be the mobile TV news trucks that set up at any particular place in order to broadcast from live events. The Uni 5 and Uni 7 bands, on the other hand, tend to consist of fixed point-to-point -point -point microwave communication networks or ground to satellite communications. And currently, the plan to avoid interfering with these systems consists of a couple of different pieces. The first plan lies in defining two tiers of access point using two different power levels. We're gonna define a low power access point as transmitting at a maximum of 30 dBm for an access point. And we're gonna allow that in all four of the bands for indoor use only. Then we're gonna define a standard power at maximum of 36 dBm for an access point and one that's only allowed in Uni 5 and Uni 7. Essentially what we're doing here is we're avoiding the mobile transmitters entirely by forbidding the use of their bands in the outdoor space and allowing pretty much everything to be used in the indoor space. And we call low power, low power, but the good news is that it's not all that different from what indoor access points are already capable of. And in a dense design, network administrators typically turn transmit power way down in any case. So far, what this seems to mean in the end is that we'll have fewer channels available for outdoor use from the get-go, 
But what we will have available will be significantly greater than what we have now and won't be subject to the strictures of things like dynamic frequency selection. The second mechanism for protecting incumbents in the six gigahertz band is going to be the requirement that standard power access points will operate under the control of something called an automated frequency coordination system, which in turn is going to allow access points or require access points to report their position to an online database that can then dictate disallowed frequencies to the access points based on that location data. This is an effort to prevent interference with things like fixed satellite and fixed microwave relay networks. This is something that has mostly been conceptualized at this point, and there's not yet a ton of detail about how this is going to be implemented. But one question of real interest to me is how this will likely affect the process of designing a new network by implicitly requiring a survey of possible AFC conflicts before placing equipment outdoors. A second technical change for 6 gigahertz that's going to give us some interesting challenges is going to lie in discovery of networks in this vast new chunk of spectrum. This challenge itself has two main parts. First, in order to further reduce overhead traffic in the spectrum, Wi-Fi 6 does away with active scanning. That is, a client device in 6 gigahertz is disallowed from stepping through all of the available channels and sending what we call null probes in which the client sends a probe to every channel saying in effect who's out there what wi-fi networks do we have instead clients in six gigahertz are generally going to be required to listen for networks via passive scanning or send probes to specific known networks only The other part of this challenge is that the total amount of new spectrum available to us means that a passive spectrum scan with a client spending 100 milliseconds listening on each of the available channels will take nearly six seconds. And that represents an unacceptable delay when a client is attempting to identify candidates for roaming. Wi-Fi 6E provides two ways to handle this. One, is that because we expect that we'll have to coexist alongside of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz networks for the foreseeable future, we expect vendors to build a dual and tri-band access points supporting both 6 gigahertz as well as one or both of the legacy bands. Access points that support 6 gigahertz and other legacy bands will be able to advertise their 6 gigahertz capabilities in those older bands. This simultaneously allows us to leverage our older bands and reduce load on the new band. Second solution, Wi-Fi 6E will also implement fast passive scanning by designating 25% of six gigahertz channels as preferred scanning channels. The preferred scanning channels will provide information about APs in the vicinity Reducing the number of channels to be scanned by 75% will make it much more feasible for clients to receive their needed information during a passive scan quickly. Finally, with respect to adoption, a new Wi-Fi Fi mode always tends to bring a chicken and egg kind of challenge. Newer technology tends to come to market at a premium price and organizations may not see a great case for newer access points until there are clients to support. In the end, it's up to client device vendors pr to produce clients that can take advantage of this new technology and it's up to network administrators to plan networks to take advantage of them. How is adoption gonna work? Well, because existing 2.4 and 5 gigahertz devices won't work in the 6 gigahertz band, and because corporate equipment refresh cycles run in anything from a three to a 10 year timeline, it seems fairly certain that implementation of 6 gigahertz networking will require coexistence with the existing 2.4 and 5 gigahertz network. 
In other words, we will likely see industry move from dual band access points to tri band access points running in all of the 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, and 6 gigahertz bands concurrently. One interesting challenge to this is that clients will likely need to work with all three frequency bands after six gigahertz is released or becomes more common. This is going to represent more antennas to fit into shrinking device form factors, and it's gonna represent more transmitters to manage power for, and it may provide one explanation for why phones are getting so big. From the standpoint of six gigahertz access points, we're gonna find ourselves serving an additional frequency band and having to cram in more radio chains into our form factors. That has a lot of possible consequences. The access points will probably become larger. They'll grow heavier. They're going to draw more power and they're probably gonna cost more. That's gonna to lead to a series of, of possible infrastructure changes. One thing that I've railed about in the past, uh, particularly in 802.11ac, is the low likelihood of needing multi-gig Ethernet in your switching infrastructure in order to support the throughput for wireless access points. Now, we may get, with combined tri-band access points, with multiple uh, radio chains, eight spatial streams in two or three radios, we may get to the point where an access point can push enough data that multi-gig ethernet might actually become a requirement. At the same time, because we're going to be powering um, additional radios, power over ethernet wattage may increase as well. You wanna look at the 802.3bt power over ethernet standard. Your network cabling might require an upgrade in order to support both of those things. And you might need a rework of your networking closets, either from the standpoint of replacing ethernet switches or upgrading power and cooling in order to support all these new requirements. So in conclusion, what do I take from this? Wi-Fi 6 access points on client devices are arriving now. Most vendors have a line available. So far, checks suggest that most of the advanced features haven't been enabled in many of those models and will be enabled in future firmware updates, but the technology is arriving in the marketplace as being quoted and sold. You wanna pay particular attention to the support for high efficiency features as it has not arrived yet. If you have any questions, you can generally perform a packet capture because you know, vendors may not uh, necessarily want to tell you everything, but the packets don't lie. If vendors can make the complicated parts of Wi-Fi 6 work, you can expect significant gains in overall performance of a network, even if individual performance does not change that much. You're going to be looking at aggregate performance gains for your network rather than individual client performance gains. And you really wanna see if you can start to think that way because aggregate performance is a very different concept. Essentially, we're filling all the aircraft instead of increasing the number of aircraft that we're sending. Look for an entirely new wave of six gigahertz capable equipment to start arriving in the next year or two. And please, please expect some significant design planning and implementation complications. And that, is all I have to say. I'll take questions. Wow, fantastic presentation, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was definitely jam pack of detail. Um, so let's uh, let's see if we can take some questions here. Okay. First one we have up. Um, I'm sorry, it's titled, You Can Now Present to a Window with Keynote 10.1 uh, as the name. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the question, but are the resource units approximately equivalent to packets or are they at least used to transmit packets, potentially of different lengths? 
So the way that I understand the resource units is that the resource units are really subdivisions of the radio frequency, so they operate at a lower level than packets. They're used to transmit packets and frames, but essentially what you're doing is you're taking that 20 megahertz of bandwidth that you have available and subdividing it. The smallest resource unit that you have available to you is essentially going to be two megahertz. And one way that you could potentially think of this, and I always, I like to talk in terms of analogies, but I also like to be very wary of analogies, is think of a 20 megahertz channel as a 20 lane highway running in one direction. In older forms of Wi-Fi, if you need to send one truck down the highway, if you need to send one truck's worth of cargo, you have to take over the entire highway for that truck. What the resource units are allowing us to do is fill more lanes of the highway. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Oh, no worry about the label. Are there improvements to block out interference to the Wi-Fi signal? So interference is always going to be an issue, and whenever interference comes up, one of the questions that people who are in Wi-Fi always ask is, well, what do you mean by interference? Um, there's a couple of different things that we describe as interference. Co-channel interference isn't really interference at all, even though we refer to it that way. And co-channel interference essentially describes the different Wi-Fi devices in a particular physical space effectively negotiating with one another for the right to transmit. The more devices you have on a channel, the more those devices have to contend and be polite to one another in order to get the opportunity to transmit. And we call that co-channel interference. So with respect to co-channel interference, if and when, BSS coloring and spatial reuse arrives in wave two. The BSS coloring that tags the various channels will theoretically allow different clients and devices running on that channel to distinguish traffic between, okay, I've got an access point in the gym that's on 36, and I've got an access point in the cafeteria that's on 36. Um, the BSS coloring and implementation of spatial reuse will allow clients associated to the access point in the gym to look at the information or the packets that they overhear from the access point in the cafeteria and say, you know what, that's not for me. I'm, the, I, I'm on the gym access point, I'm red, this traffic is green, so I'm just going to drop that. With respect to the other kind of interference, that is uh, noise interference on the channel, there are some ways in which newer Wi-Fi 802.11ax may be sub more subject to interference because the increased symbol length leads transmissions to be longer and potentially more liable to brief disruption. So there are places where interference problems may grow. The good news is, is that in the five gigahertz band, we've overall seen less of that kind of disruptive interference in general. There are many fewer devices in the five gigahertz band that are gonna generate interference that's essentially just static on the line. The 2.4 gigahertz band is where we're really liable to interference from cordless phones, security cameras, microwave ovens, um, the baby monitor that I've been carrying around for five years, those kinds of things. Um, I'm not sure what I can expect from six gigahertz, but I would expect um, that at least given the fact that it's a much wider set of channels for us, we have more options to avoid interferes if they do begin to exist. Okay. Um, so are the color tags detectable even at low signal levels? Uh, as far as I know, I believe that they're in the, uh, the beacon frames uh, that the access points broadcast. So in general, those frames are broadcast at a relatively low data rate, and they're designed to be detectable at a relatively long range. So the uh, I believe the screenshot that I showed of the wireless access point that was broadcasting a color is from a townhouse probably 
oh, 80 to 90 feet from my dining room table through a set of trees and everybody's walls. So it's picked up at a relatively good distance. Okay. Um, how can you tell which features are implemented? Probably the best way to do that, uh, one is you can start by talking to vendor support. I always recommend, and this is something that I don't stress enough, is that with particular vendors, if you want something supported, even if they're not going to support it, you always want to ask so that they're receiving those requests. But again, um, vendors might hide things, but packets don't lie. So in general, if you are experienced or even inexperienced with tools like Wireshark and Airtool, you can capture the traffic going back and forth on networks and look at the content of either beacon frames from wireless access points. Beacon frames tend to be used by the wireless access points to advertise the capabilities of the access points. Um, and then with respect to client devices, if you capture an association between a client and a network or a probe request um, between a client and a network, typically the client will be advertising its own capabilities so it can negotiate its connection with the network. So it requires a little bit of diving into kind of the tools around network analysis. That is uh, Adrian Granados's Air tool is a great tool for capturing without really having to think about it too much. Wireshark is a little bit more arcane and kind of represents a form of dark magic, but once you get into it, you can find very interesting things. Okay, um, so can you speak to how maybe some of these features might be deployable to existing hardware via firmware updates, or will some of them require ex like physical hardware replacements? So it's going to depend very much on which hardware you're talking about. And th there's always a little bit of uncertainty in this. But for example, I do a reasonably large amount of work with Cisco Meraki, and Cisco Meraki um, is currently selling a series of wireless access points that at least on the 10, you know, they claim to support a lot of these advanced features, um, OFDMA in particular, BSS coloring, uh, in some cases the downlink MUMIMO, but not yet the uplink MUMIMO or the spatial reuse. So I tend to, to, to suggest that you have to start by talking with the vendors and then you probably want to demo the devices and check for yourself. With respect to client devices, we're heavily dependent on the client device vendors to decide what features they're going to support and what features they're not going to support and add that support to the devices. So our existing iPhone 11, iPad Pro March 2020, iPhone SE 2 all have Wi-Fi 6 capable chipsets built into them. That show much shows up in the probe requests and the association requests, but the supported features don't show up yet. So ultimately, and I know we're all Apple people, so I know we all hate to hear this. This is going to be a file feedback kind of request. File feedback, file feedback, file feedback. Let them know you want it. Eventually, maybe it will show up, but we never know Apple's plans. Absolutely true. Oh, and let, me, let me add one more comment to that. Um, you know, I've talked about the iOS devices. At this point, None of the Mac OS devices that I've seen have a Wi-Fi 6 802.11ax chipset. So ultimately, in order to take advantage of AX or to take advantage of 6 gigahertz, those devices will probably have to be replaced. And what that's going to look like, hopefully, is paying careful attention to your device life cycle and your fleet life cycle and aging things out gracefully and gradually while designing networks that can accommodate both the legacy technology and the new technology. Okay, kind of kind of building on that, um, it's going to take a lot of adoption before uh, this technology will make a difference. Uh, are, are there any consequences on what percentage, or consensus, sorry, on what percentage of clients are required before this actually makes sense to implement? I've heard different estimates, but I haven't really 
jumped into the math. I was at an event where um, someone estimated approximately 30% of your fleet before you begin to see real benefits from 802.11 AX and its technologies. Um, I think that a lot of this is based on simulation and guesswork at this point in that on the ground, we're not 100% sure yet. So I don't have a solid answer for that. Okay. Um, can you share with us what tool was used to scan the Wi-Fi networks? Uh, that was Adrian Granados' Wi-Fi Explorer. And Adrian Granados' um, Air Tool and Wi-Fi Signal. I'm always happy to plug Adrian and his work. He's recently uh, started producing his software full time. And I would suggest that anyone who wants uh, a set of say entry level tools that are still relatively sophisticated to get into Wi-Fi, um, I don't think you can do any better to buy his tools. Okay, great. Um, are there likely to be wide differences between the home and commercial Wi-Fi 6 implementations? <sighs> That's a hard question for me to answer because I don't spend much time dealing with home implementations. What I would expect kind of based on previous behavior, and I don't know how this will pan out, is I'm unclear on what a lot of home Wi-Fi vendors do in terms of pushing feature updates via firmware. And there's really, there, there's a couple of different categories even of the home Wi-Fi vendors, because you have your Eros, you have your Google Wi-Fi, you have your Nets, uh, Netgear Orbi type of equipment uh, that are coming from third-party vendors that manufacture network equipment and sell directly to the customer. You also have OEM vendors who seem to be primarily oriented towards selling into uh, wholesale environments for vendors that deliver systems to their customers. And Comcast is a really good example. If you open a Wi-Fi sniffer and take a walk around a neighborhood in Seattle, probably 50 to 75% of the networks that you'll bump into use Technicolor as their hardware. And that's almost always a tell that this is a, this is a Comcast network. Um, in general, I don't know that I have greater expectations for home network vendors simply because the margins aren't as high. Um, and it's unclear to me how much attention a lot of these vendors are going to be giving to updating hardware. This has always been a problem, both in Wi-Fi and computer equipment in general, but I'm ultimately not equipped to answer the question. Like I have my guess, but maybe I'll be proven wrong. Okay, fair enough, absolutely. Um, so microwaves will always be a problem for Wi-Fi networks is what you're saying? Microwaves will always be a problem for 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi networks. Let's see, this is a comment slash question. Now, on macOS, there is no good way to force clients to use 5 gigahertz instead of 2.4 and hence have a suboptimal network experience, even with band steering and 2.4 off near building entrances. Do you see any pr improvements here with Wi-Fi 6 and or also a 6 gigahertz band? Great presentation, thanks. I do not have any real answer to that question. So much of that depends on the way that Apple designs their drivers and implements their drivers for uh, their Wi-Fi network interfaces. Um, but in general, I agree with the comment that I see, um, it's, a, it's been interesting under Mojave, I saw a lot of very good behavior in terms of deciding whether to join a five gigahertz network or a 2.4 gigahertz network. Under Catalina, the behavior that I've seen has been significantly more erratic, band steering or no band steering. Um, I see in my own home network, I have a pair of access points that broadcast on 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz, and I have the 2.4 gigahertz transmit power turned way, way, way down compared to the 5 gigahertz transmit power in an effort to force my devices to 5 gigahertz, but I still see my MacBook Pro joining the 2.4 gigahertz network that I set up, you know, every third or fourth association.
Interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. How long do you expect it to take before reliable AX becomes available to home users? I think a Personally, I think the thing that's going to drive that the most is going to be the client device vendors producing client devices that will take advantage of it and the subsequent pressure that that may put on access point and network vendors to push their devices forward. Again, we're Apple people. We don't know what Apple's plans are. We don't know that Apple's not really saying anything. Apple has released some hardware with 802.11ax chipsets, but with most of the sophisticated features apparently disabled. So I think the thing that you're looking for at that point is for Apple to be pushing into the 802.11ax market and saying, okay, we're taking advantage of all of this cool stuff that 802.11ax offers, get with the program network vendors. That in particular, I think, is what will drive the features of, of home networks um, towards more efficient use. Another piece that I would probably comment on there is that one of the, the great benefits of Wi-Fi being backwards compatible is that to a certain extent, Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi, whether it's an 802.11b network, an N network, an AC network, um, or now an AX network. Um, there's a lot of backwards compatibility here. And what that means um, is that old devices will continue to work, but it also means that there may not be as much motivation from a customer standpoint to go out and replace working equipment with new equipment in order to derive those new benefits. So I think there's a couple of aspects of that conversation. Somebody has to push um, the performance capabilities of 802.11ax from the client perspective, and then that has to change from the access point perspective one way or another. Okay, and I think that kind of drives into the follow-up question here. Um, do, you, do you expect manufacturers to drop 2.4 gigahertz support or some of those older technologies to kind of push in favor? I think it's that gonna... compatibility. Yeah, I think it's going to vary from vendor to vendor. Right now, I feel like 2.4 gigahertz is present enough that I don't see it happening in the foreseeable future. And one thing that I do kind of expect, and this is this is a market that I'm not as familiar with, um, is the IoT home device market. A lot of devices that go, get sold for home automation um, or IoT devices tend to be pushed down to a very low price point for mass consumer adoption. And what that tends to encourage, in my view, is a need to push the cost of those devices down, which oftentimes pushes vendors or manufacturers towards, well, I don't really want to think too much about what's the best choice for a Wi-Fi chipset. What's the cheapest choice for a Wi-Fi chipset? Um, I had a, a little incident where I was working in a sculpture studio here in Seattle. It's a small studio. It's a two access point network, um, but I delivered some brand new access points and the customers all in on Apple stuff. So most of their stuff is very cutting edge. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to turn off 2.4 gigahertz or I'm going to turn. I think I turned band steering on so that 2.4 gigahertz wouldn't advertise. And two months later, I got a call from the customer saying, hey, I've got a sprinkler system vendor here who claims that they can't get my sprinkler system controller on the Wi-Fi network. Ended up having to turn 2.4 gigahertz back on. So those are the kinds of things that we see continuing to use 2.4. And one of the benefits that 802.11ax will bring to us in 2.4, again, at least in theory, is that because we only have 320 megahertz channels that we can use effectively, taking those channels and dividing them into smaller sub-channels via resource units is gonna make it possible for us to essentially do more with less in the 2.4 gigahertz band. A lot of those devices, sprinkler controller as an example, I can't imagine that that uses much traffic, generates much traffic. It's mostly gonna be small amounts of data and small amounts of control traffic. So 
2.4 will probably be around for the foreseeable future, but hopefully it'll, it'll become a little bit more usable. Okay, fantastic. Um, so what, what would you think is a realistic count for client devices in a physical space with current technologies uh, with N slash AC versus with these new options? So like a large venue uh, from audit auditorium to stadiums, anywhere from like 5,000, 500 to 2,000 people. Um, are you gonna are we gonna see an increase in like the amount of people that can use these? The, the I think the idea is that for certain types of traffic, yes, we're looking to see an increase in capacity, both because a lot of these client devices are not really needing to use the full 20 megahertz channel, um, and because we're gonna have more channels available in 802.11x. How is that actually gonna play out? I don't. It, it's hard to really say. There's no hard and fast answer for how many devices per access point. When you get into the, the wireless LAN industry and start going to their conferences, there's a very a quasi-famous gentleman in that vertical who claims that the first answer to any Wi-Fi question is always, it depends. And it depends on you know, what kind of clients are they? What are they doing? Are they trying to stream video? Are they trying to access a website? Or are they trying to read email? It's a hard question to answer. And one of the issues that you run into with Wi-Fi is that there are so many different use models for devices on Wi-Fi that you can build a model for a particular design of a network to accomplish particular things, and then somebody walks in with a new device expecting to do something else, and your model gets blown out of the water. So it's a hard question to answer. Yeah, that's a great answer, though. Um, okay, what's your what's the number one creative Wi-Fi SSID name you've come across? Oh, tell my Wi-Fi lover. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, should we think about the Wi-Fi signal carry? Should we think about the Wi-Fi signal carry far longer than it is usable when we design physical office? Is right. For example, um, a paint or a thin shielding layer on the wall where you want to stop signals. Yeah, this is something that I've I've been very interested in, and it's something that I've looked into briefly on occasion, because the person asking the question is right, different materials attenuate Wi-Fi differently, um, but they're not always just sort of targeted about what radio signals that they will stop. So in a lot of the same places where you have um, say schools where you have cinder block walls or thick brick walls that will attenuate signal, um, you can use that in order to increase the attenuation or reduce the coverage of a particular Wi-Fi cell. But oftentimes you also find that those materials have adverse effects on other things that you may consider critical, such as cell phone signals. And so I've investigated just kind of briefly the idea of, well, let's take some Wi-Fi absorbent paint and paint a particular wall in order to prevent signal from coming in from the outside. I've heard anecdotally that that kind of thing works, but you have to ask yourself, what kind of things does it stop um, besides the Wi-Fi? And I think that the, that's something you end up having to be very, very careful with. And I think that, with respect to dense designs, schools, um, open floor plan offices, if they continue to exist when we go back to work, things like that, um, you're going to see a couple of things. The, the, the 802.11ax resource units and subchannels um, and the Wi-Fi 6E increase in the number of channels will be very helpful in lowering the amount of co-channel interference that we have. But in those types of environments, we almost always also end up looking at either signal focusing via directional antennas rather than omnidirectional antennas that just kind of blow out their signal in a giant spear shape. You can look, you can get antennas that transmit more in the shape of a flashlight or a searchlight. Um, that's one way to handle it. Or you use um, physical barriers to attenuate the signal. 
um, that is in a lot of stadium environments, as I understand it, I haven't done a stadium design or any stadium work myself. Uh, one of the things that's changed in stadiums is that stadium designers have gone from trying to mount wireless access points overhead or on handrails to installed underneath seats with the expectation that what they're going to do is they're going to use the crowd presence to attenuate the signal and reduce the usable range of the signal. Hmm. Um, so those are the kinds of techniques that I would probably be looking at because the inverse square law is a pretty merciless thing. Um, I talked about how far a signal will go in my roaming talk I think a year or two ago and um, you know, the signal just goes and goes and goes, and you can use construction, you can use power reduction, you can use obstacles, and you can use um, direction setting to affect that, but my feeling is that you're never going to be entirely able to control it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, is there is support for WPA3 independent of Wi-Fi 6, or, or in other words, Will Wi-Fi 6 capable hardware also be able to support WPA3? So Wi-Fi 6 hardware will be able to support WPA3 as I understand it. I don't remember if it was Catalina or Mojave built WPA3 into the operating system. So my feeling is that uh, WPA3 support is not dependent on uh, FI mode support. OK, great. Uh, Another comment for Wi-Fi Explorer is great. Uh, I'll second that as well. And we've come to the end of our Q&A. Okay. So I think that's probably about all the questions we're going to get. Um, usually I like to just kind of babble for a second and make sure nothing else pops in, but uh, it looks like Looks like that's going to be it. I think all of our brains might be filled to capacity right now with some new information. Uh, mine sure is. Chris, thank you so much again for presenting the second session of today, the Mac and Miss Campfire session. Always happy to be back. If you run into additional questions, feel free to find me in the PSU Mac channel uh, or in the Wi Fi channel on Mac Admin Slack. No threads, no masters. <laughs>